If any comrade suggests a name, I will put it to the vote. I move that Comrade Gregory be elected Thursday. Does anyone second? Second the motion. Before I put the matter to the vote, I will call on Comrade Gregory to make a statement. Gregory Rose. He must have figured out that his best chance was to make a softened and ambiguous speech, such as would leave in my mind the impression that the Brotherhood was a very mild affair after all. My friend, that is a fact there. It is deep, deep under the earth that we, the persecuted, are permitted to assemble as the Christians assembled in the catacombs. Suppose we seem as shocking as the Christians because we are really as harmless as the Christians. Suppose we seem as mad as the Christians because we are really as meek. I am not meek. Comrade with a spoon tells us that he is not meek. <laughs> How little he knows himself. We are simple as they were simple. Look at Comrade with a spoon. We are modest as they were modest. Look at me. We are merciful. No, no, I no. say we are merciful as the early Christians were merciful. Yet... This did not prevent their being accused of eating flesh. Now, we do not eat human flesh. Shame! Why not? Comrade with a spoon is anxious to know why nobody eats him. In our society, at any rate, which loves him sincerely, which is founded on love... No, no! Down with love! Which is founded on love! There will be no difficulty about the aims which we shall pursue as a body or which I should pursue were I chosen as the representative of that body. Does anyone oppose the election of Comrade Gregory? Yes, 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 yes. Comrade! Comrade! Who are you? Gabriel Time! Comrade Time! Comrade Time, the special delegate! Let me speak! Have we come here for this? Comrades, we line these walls with weapons and bar that door with death. Lest anyone should come and hear Comrade Gregory saying to us, be good and you will be happy. Honesty is the best policy and virtue is its own reward. Uh, Comrade Gregory has told us that we are not the enemies of society. But I say that we are the enemies of society and so much the worse for society. <laughs> Comrade Gregory accuses me of hypocrisy. He knows as well as I do that I am keeping all my engagements and doing nothing but my duty. I do not mince words. I do not pretend to. We do not want the Supreme Council of Anarchy infected with a maudlin mercy. Have Gregory and his milk and water methods on the Supreme Council? I would offer myself for election. Stop, you blasphemy, Stop, stop, I tell you. I move as an amendment that Comrade Syme be appointed to the post. Stop all this, I tell you. Stop it. It is all impossible. I beg to second the election. Comrades, I kneel to you. Do not elect this man. The question is that Comrade Stein be elected to the post of Thursday on the General Council. Hey! And three minutes afterwards, Mr. Gabriel Syme of the Secret Police Service was elected to the post of Thursday on the General Council of the Anarchists of Europe. Hey! A moment later, I found myself, somehow or other, face to face with Gregory. You are a devil. And you are a gentleman. Comrade Thursday, the boat is quite ready. Comrade Gregory, you've kept your word. You're a man of honor, and I thank you. What do you mean? What did I promise you? A very entertaining evening. is really Gabriel Syme. I'm not merely a detective who pretends to be a poet. I'm really a poet who has become a detective. I come of a family of cranks. One of my uncles always walked about without a hat. And another had made an unsuccessful attempt to walk about with a hat and nothing else. Being surrounded with every conceivable kind of revolt from infancy, I had to revolt into something, so I revolted into the only thing left, which was sanity. Now, some months before that evening in Saffron Park, I appeared before a high official in Scotland Yard. I was led to a side door. And almost before I knew what I was doing, I was suddenly shown into a room, the abrupt blackness of which startled me like a blaze of light. Are you the new recruit? All right. You're engaged. 
I really have no experience. No one has any experience of the Battle of Armageddon. But I'm really unfit. You're willing, that is enough. Well, really. I don't know any profession of which mere willingness is the final test. I do. Martyrs. I'm condemning you to death. Good day. Where my adventure ultimately led me, I've already told you. At about half past one on a February night, I found myself steaming on a small tug up the silent Thames, the duly elected Thursday of the Central Council of Anarchists. As we came alongside, the great stones of the embankment were big and black against the huge white dawn. I leapt out of the boat onto the slimy steps. The tug put off again and turned upstream. And I saw that there was a man leaning over the parapet and looking out across the river. And then the man smiled. And his smile was a shock. For it was all on one side, going up the right cheek and down on the left. With the dark dawn and the deadly errand and the loneliness and the great dripping stones, there was something unnerving in it. There was the silent river and the silent man. And there was the last nightmare touch that his smile had suddenly went wrong. If we walk up towards Leicester Square, we shall just be in time for breakfast. Sunday always insists on an early breakfast. At one corner of Leicester Square, there projected the balcony of a prosperous but quiet hotel. The balcony contained a breakfast table. And round the breakfast table, glowing in the sunlight, were a group of noisy and talkative men, all dressed in the insolence of fashion. Here, then, was the secret conclave of the European dynamiters. Then, as I continued to stare at them, I saw something that I had not seen before, literally because it was too large to see. At the nearest end of the balcony, blocking up a great part of the perspective, was the back of a great mountain of a man. I first thought that the weight of him must break down the balcony of stone. This man was planned enormously in his original proportions, like a statue carved deliberately as colossal. His head crowned with white hair, as seen from behind, looked bigger than a head ought to be. The ears that stood out from it looked larger than human ears. His sense of size was so staggering that when I saw him, all the other figures seemed quite suddenly to dwindle and become dwarfish. They were still sitting there as before with their flowers and frock coats. But now it looked as if the big man was entertaining five children to tea. I never thought of asking whether the monstrous man who almost filled and broke the balcony was the great president Sunday, whom the others had stood in awe. I knew it was so. As I walked across the inner room towards the balcony, the large face of Sunday grew larger and larger, and I was gripped with a fear that when he was quite close... The face would be too big to be possible, and that I would scream aloud. I remember that as a child I would not look at the mask of Memnon in the British Museum, because it was a face and so large. By an effort braver than that of leaping over a cliff, I went to an empty seat at the breakfast table and sat down. At that moment, the president was addressing a man, out of whose collar there sprang a bewildering bush of brown hair and beard that almost obscured the eyes, like those of a sky terrier. The man's name, it seemed, was Gogo. He was a Pole. And in the circle of days, he was called Tuesday. Our friend Tuesday insists on the ways of the stage conspirator. Now, if a gentleman goes about London in a top hat and a frock coat, no one need know that he's an anarchist. But if a gentleman puts on a top hat and a frock coat and then goes about on his hands and knees, well, he may attract attention. I am not good at concealment. I am not ashamed of the cause. Yes, you are, my boy, and so is the cause of you. I am not good at deception. Right, my boy, right. You aren't good at anything. As I looked at the others, I began to see in each of them exactly what I had seen in the man by the river. Each man was subtly and differently wrong. Next to me sat Tuesday, the tousle-headed Gogol. Next was Wednesday, a certain Marquis de Saint-Eustache. In the gloom and thickness of his beard, a dark red mouth showed sensual and scornful. Whatever he was, he was not a Frenchman. 